understand the magnitude uh, of its importance, just the, this new epidemic of HPV positive uh, or occurring skin first. So um, this, is, this is my pathway. Um, I was here in 2000, I graduated in 2009. I was in Morrissey, uh, went to uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, for residency, it was in Baylor first for medical school. Um, got to move down south for some good weather um, in South Carolina for one year, and then uh, I'm back up in uh, Pittsburgh now. Um, so that's, this is what I'm doing currently. So most of my practice now is head and neck uh, surgical oncology and reconstructive surgery, and I do some clinical outcomes research and some translational research in uh, head and neck oncology. All right, so I thought I would put the summary slide up first so that if people need to get back to their tailgate, they can read this, and they've gotten pretty much all the, the points of the talk here. So the main point is HPV is incredibly common, okay, and about 80% of people will get infected with HPV at some point in their life, so it's, so it's a lot. Um, High-risk oral HPV, that is having HPV 16 or 18 in your oral cavity or oral pharynx is also common, it's about 7 to 8%. Um, and the inc what, people, what most people don't know is the incidence of oropharynx cancer is skyrocketing, and it's actually outpaced the incidence of cervical cancer at this point. So HPV-associated oropharynx cancer is the most common HPV-associated cancer right now. Uh, men are dis disproportionately affected, and specifically white Caucasian young men in their 40s and 50s. Um, and you know, fortunately, we have a vaccination that's, that's incredibly effective. So, you know, when I was thinking about the goals for this talk, um, these were really the these were really the, the the two goals. Okay, basically to kind of review oropharynx cancer, um, because the truth is, unless you're in this field, most people don't know a lot about it, um, and then convince you that you should be vaccinated for HPV. It doesn't matter how old you are. So, just as a show of hands, how many people here are HPV vaccinated? All right. So. People, generally people, younger generation, probably got their HPV vaccine in, in their teens or in college. So uh, the HPV vaccine is actually FDA approved for adults now too. Um, obviously the recommendations are just until you're 26, but it's approved for adults as well. So in terms of convincing you that you should be vaccinated for HPV. So um, I was talking to one of our surgical fellows uh, last week and I said, you know, I'm giving this talk at Notre Dame, I gotta, you know, talk to a bunch of Catholics about, you know, um, oral HPV and, you know, a sexually transmitted disease. And I got to convince them that they should actually vaccinate themselves and their kids. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, you know, I can, I can give them a lot of information, but what's the, how, how, how can I actually convince people? And he was like, well, you know, if they saw what we were doing today, they would, they would vaccinate their kids tomorrow. So I kind of took that to heart. I, I bought a GoPro um, and we took it into the OR. Um, and so I'm going to just bring you into the OR, and these are these are two cases um, that were we had over the last two weeks, both uh, HPV associated uh, disease. Um, so that's where we're going to start with. So I guess one little disclaimer: uh, head neck surgery is a little bit gruesome. So if you're not ready for that, I assume most people here have been in an anatomy lab, and this is not going to be. Uh, that, that groundbreaking, but um, just as, as a disclaimer, if, if your stomach's not gonna tolerate it. So, probably the most graphic picture and the most horrific picture in this whole talk is this one, uh, mainly because our, uh, our football team couldn't, couldn't beat uh, Michigan. I, we have, unfortunately, we have like three Michigan uh, fans and residents in our program, so we made a bet that I had to wear this horrific scrub cap for, uh, for two weeks after we lost to Michigan. So, I finally finished uh, serving my uh, penance, but uh, that was painful. All right, so this first case, figure would be uh, nice to start with the case. So it's a 60-year-old guy. Um, he's actually a professor at a local uh, university in Pittsburgh. Uh, pretty healthy, um, you know, he's got some hypertension, hyperlipidemia, but uh, really nothing in the way of medical history. And he really just presented because he had a sore throat. Um, he had seen his PCP a couple times. Um, <laughs> Had a little bit of shortness of breath, had been treated for a pharyngitis, um, nothing, nothing really to write home about, but just had persisted. So he came into our clinic, we did uh, what's called a flexible laryngoscopy, which is just an in-office endoscopy, and we found that he had a, a laryngeal tumor. And so we took him to the OR, this is his uh, uh, findings from the operating room, um, and so you can see this kind of fungating tumor that kind of arises on his epiglottis, obviously that's the endotracheal tube. 
Uh, we took a biopsy here, um, and it came back as basal white squamous cell carcinoma, P16 positive. Uh, P16 is a immunohistochemical uh, surrogate for HPV positivity in these cancers. Uh, so this was a HPV associated uh, laryngeal cancer, which is which is uncommon. Most most of these cancers are oropharynx, uh, but this was kind of unique. So he, uh, we obviously we got some imaging on him. You can see here he's got this massive uh, epiglottic tumor that's almost completely obstructing his airway. On the axial cuts here, you can see this thing is actually eroding through the uh, thyroid cartilage. Um, so this is a, a T4, stage four uh, larynx cancer associated with HPV. We got we got a PET scan which showed that you know he didn't have any regionally or distant metastatic disease. This was localized to the larynx. Uh, so he needed surgery, and the only the only sur surgery that you can provide for a T4 larynx cancer is to actually take the larynx out. So he needed a total laryngectomy, partial pharyngectomy, so removing the entire larynx, taking out all the nodes in the neck, so bilateral neck dissection. Uh, we're going to just show you what this looks like. This is a this is the consequence of a sexually transmitted disease, which most people um, don't often think so about. So we're looking for the spinal accessory nerve uh, underneath the cerebellum actuating muscle. Does that sound a little deranged? Unfortunately, Mo here, one of our residents, is a Michigan grad. He's led into the program despite that. But this, this patient's having a uh, total laryngectomy and partial pharyngectomy for a laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma. He got uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, um, and now he's having a scheduled surgery. They're just following the spinal accessory nerve up to the skull base. You can see how massive an, an incision this is. This is not a uh, surgery that anyone wants. Can you show that a neck dissection on this side? Mm -hmm. The neck dissection on this side has already been completed. You can see the internal jugular vein, the carotid artery, internal kind of mastoid muscle. All the lymph nodes have been removed. Beautiful. All right, GoPro stop recording. So that's obviously a massive defect, right? So this is this is an intraoperative photo. Um, and for those coming in, this is a patient that had a larynx cancer. This had a total laryngectomy related to an HPV positive uh, tumor. And so you can see here, he's, he's had neck dissections on both sides, his carotid artery is exposed on both sides, he's got a small strip of pharyngeal mucosa, so this, need, this, needs, to be, this needs to be reconstructed, because he, and, uh, you can see his, his trachea has been brought up to the skin and sutures, he has a permanent uh, tracheostoma. So we, we, we start with the um, reconstruction here, this is just a picture of what the tumor ultimately looked like when we sent it to pathology. Um, so this is looking at the larynx from the back side. You can see the, the back side of the posterior tracheoretinoid muscles, the thyroid cartilage, and this massive fungating tumor um, in, in the uh, larynx originating off the, off the epiglottis. So to reconstruct this, um, you know, with this big a defect, he needs what's called a free flap, which is basically transplanting tissue from one side of the body, bringing it up, bringing it up into the defect, and actually sewing the blood vessels to the to the, uh, to the flap uh, vessel. So here we're doing an anterolateral thigh flap. This is one of our residents operating here. Um, and you can see this is just the beginning of the harvest. So we're able to do this simultaneous as the oncologic team is, uh, is working. We were able to work and harvest the flap uh, in a simultaneous fashion. So this, this, this flap is based on skin perforators from the descending branch of the lateral circumflex artery. Uh, this is just uh, some video of, you know, we're isolating the flap here. Uh, so we use it like five minutes and some vast muscle. 41% and falling. Thank you. Uh, ablative team working yeah. at the head. Uh, we have some deep branches here. Yeah. On the airway. So basically what we're doing here is we have the flap totally dissected. We're isolating the, the artery in the vein that are going to subsequently be used for the, for the microvascular anastomosis. So that's the harvest of the flap. So then the, the flap is brought up to the head and neck. Um, and uh, we, uh, we basically have to reconstruct the neopharynx with it. So sew so this, this entire thing in place. Uh, and then do the microvascular work. So this is uh, our fellow and our resident uh, doing the microvascular work, doing the arterial anastomosis here. Um, they're sewing the superior thyroid artery to the artery of our flap here. You can see these are, this is obviously a technical exercise. Um, 
is up to about two and a half millimeter thick. Um, so this is, you know, you'll have to do a, a fellowship to, to do this microvascular work, either in ENT or plastic surgery generally. Um, so now we've, we've, done the, we've done the microvascular work and uh, the graft is in place. Um, and here, this, is, this is just us checking the vascularity of the flap. So we're gonna inject some, what's called ICG dye, okay, which is a intravascular dye that fluoresces under a laser. And we're able to see that this thing actually has blood flow. So you see the artery light up first and then you see the vein filling there and the flap, which is over on the right side. Um, you know, we can tell this thing is well vascularized after, after we transplant it up to the neck. So then the skin get cl gets closed and that's the end of the case. So that's, that's one HPV associated uh, cancer uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, so this is, this is the next one. Um, so this is this patient has a little bit more medical history, but he was treated for an HPV associated or occurrence cancer. Uh, he got chemo radiation therapy, which generally is accepted to be the standard of care for uh, or occurrence cancer. Um, and he was cured of this cancer, actually, which is, which is great. But uh, he developed what's called mandibular osteoradionecrosis, which is essentially that his mandible necrosed as a consequence of the, uh, the radiation therapy. So he presented to our clinic with a draining neck wound, he had saliva draining into his neck, and a mandible fracture in this open communication. So, so he needs this operated on. So what he, what he required was a mandibulectomy here. So you can see at the top, um, where this is a 3D planning session where we plan out his mandibulectomy. You can see kind of the erosive changes to the bone. Um, so the uh, oncologic or blade surgeon plans out the, uh, plans out the uh, mandibulectomy. And then we, get, we can actually plan the reconstruction in a 3D fashion. So this is bone from his fibula that we're using to plan the osteotomies uh, preoperatively. So this is all done about two weeks ahead of surgery. We get a custom made titanium plate that's fit to his mandible. Um, and then this is, this is him at the time of surgery. So you can see his uh, plate's been put on, he's had his mandible resected. Um, you know, you can kind of see the inferior alveolar nerve there kind of hanging down under the uh, yellow clip. So this is the defect we have to fill with the flap. So, you know, for this case we used uh, his fibula. So the fibula is a, essentially a non structurally significant uh, bone and leg. Most people don't know that. You can take this with impunity. So we take the entire fibula. Most patients ambulate and they function uh, quite well after surgery. So this flap is taken, so the entire fibula bone, uh, skin paddle, which has a skin, pad, uh, skin perforator associated with the perineal artery. We take some, uh, some flexor hallucis longus muscle and a little cuff of soleus muscle. So this is, this is what we're use, using to reconstruct the mandible. And you can see these kind of fancy cutting guides. Uh, they're actually made by Stryker uh, preoperatively, so this becomes pretty easy actually. You just you slap these things on there and you cut the bone and it's perfectly osteotomized for, for the inside of the flap. Uh, so this, this is just us harvesting the, uh, the fibula flap. Let's see if this, is, this video wants to work. But, so similar concept, we transplant this thing up to the head and neck. You can see here the bone, the bone has been inset to the defect. For some reason, the, the video like mirror image here. Um, so the bone's been inset, and then we have our skin paddle, which is basically reconstructing the external skin that had to be taken as a consequence of the fistula that we had. So you see the bone in place, that's our, that's our skin paddle for our flap. We're doing the same thing, we're using ICG to see uh, you know, how the vascularity is. And this thing is a little bit slower to light up. It ultimately does, it's hard to see. That's our skin paddle lighting up. So we know that the flap is viable, it has blood supply. So, you know, ultimately these are two cases that really highlight how morbid uh, these HPV associated diseases can be. Yeah? So are these two people still alive? Uh huh. Did the cancer come back? We just did these cases two weeks ago. Oh. So these people are still in the hospital. Uh, so, you know, the second gentleman, you know, has been cancer free for three years. So his was just a complication of radiotherapy. The first gentleman with a T4 larynx cancer after a laryngectomy, his prognosis is actually quite good, especially with an HPV associated uh, tumor. But the big ticket item there is a lot of these patients have significant mor morbidity related to HPV. So what about head and neck cancer in general? So HPV, uh, head and neck cancer, HPV and non-HPV related is about the sixth most common cancer in the world. It's about half a million people diagnosed on an annual basis. 
in general, the five-year overall survival is around 50%. Um, and despite a lot of innovation, despite a lot of new chemotherapeutic drugs, there really hasn't been a tremendous improvement in survival over the last three decades. Um, but what we do know is that the epidemiology of oropharynx cancer, and specifically head and neck cancer, is changing. So this was, you know, 20 years ago, this was, this was the, our standard head and neck cancer patient. You know, older, long-standing history of smoking, alcohol, uh, but the demographic is changing, and we're seeing a new, so Michael Douglas, if anyone doesn't know, he was diagnosed with oropharynx cancer in, in 2006, but we're, we're seeing this new wave, younger, healthier, middle-aged men that are getting these tonsillar and basal tongue cancers. So fortunately, because the incidence of smoking is going down, um, most head and neck cancers are declining in incidence. So you can see at most subsites in the oral cavity, nasopharynx, um, they're all going down, but there's a subset of tonsillar and basal tongue cancers that are really skyrocketing in terms of their uh, incidence. And this is really within a age subset of men in their kind of 40s to 60s. We obviously, we do see it in women, but it's about four times less common. So how do people even really figure this out? Um, so in the 80s, they were doing a bunch of studies on HPV-associated cervical cancer. Um, and the first study to really find it was they were looking at secondary malignancies following radiation for cervical cancer. So they, the intent was to find people that had late onset sarcomas from radiation therapy and to see what their secondary malignancies were. And what they ultimately found is that a bunch of these people randomly had oropharynx cancers. And it, was, you know, it wasn't known that this was HPV related at the time. So then subsequently people took this study, did a couple case control studies that further kind of developed this concept. Um, and then in 2007, for the first time, the WHO actually recognized HPV as a cause of oropharynx cancer, and that's largely because uh, people actually found that uh, when they sequenced these tumors, they found HPV-associated DNA and um, expression products in, in the tumor. So, so in 2006, 2007, we find out that HPV causes oropharynx cancer. You know, just to start out, like what, kind of at a basic level, what, what's the oropharynx? So, you know, it's probably easily described in the sagittal plane. It basically goes from the soft, soft palate down to the hyoid bone. But for all practical purposes, it involves the, the tonsils, the base of tongue here, the soft palate, and the posterior pharyngeal wall. So pretty much everything you can see in this photo is, is the oropharynx. And we see about 60% of oropharynx cancers occur, occur in the tonsils, about a third, third in the base of the tongue. So that's, that's kind of the, the anatomy that we're dealing with here. So, what do we actually know about clinically with oropharynx cancer? So now, um, over 70%, and some people will say up to 90% of oropharynx cancers are HPV positive. Um, the mean age of diagnosis is around 50. Um, the primary risk factor is oral HPV infection. That's, that's pretty clear. Um, there's about a 10 to 30 year latency from infection to the development of uh, malignancy. Um, these patients classically present with a very, very small primary tumor, advanced nodal disease, which is very characteristic. And fortunately, they have improved survival relative to HPV negative cancer. So how do these people actually show up in the clinic? Um, they usually present with a neck mass. So this is, this is the most common presentation of oropharynx cancer. They come in asymptomatic. They say, doc, I was shaven, and I noticed this lump in my neck. Um, you know, so they all generally, they get a CT scan. Um, it often shows a cystic neck metastasis. People often mistake this for something like a brachial plexus. So if you're, if you're seeing someone and uh, if you're seeing an adult with a cystic neck mass, it's cancer until proven otherwise. Don't, you know, adults rarely have brachial plexus. So that's a, that's a common mistake that a lot of, um, you know, private practice ENTs and, and you know, family practitioners will make and work these people up. So these people obviously get imaging workup, they get their neck mass off a needle biopsy for P16, um, and then they get treated. So how do they get treated? And obviously this could be a whole lecture in and of itself to talk about the treatment of oropharynx cancer. Uh, but that's not really the goal for today. But just over time, this has evolved quite a bit. So for the 90s, these people were getting surgeries like you saw at the beginning of this talk. They were getting massive open surgeries, even for small tumors, um, because people felt that surgery was the best way to go. Um, and the oropharynx is an inherently a surgically very difficult place to access. So these people had massive surgeries, the mandible had to be split open to access. So 
that was how it started. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, they figured out that these tumors actually respond very well to chemo radiation. So that quickly became the standard of care. And now what we're finding, really over the last 10 years, just like our second patient, people have a lot of treatment-related morbidity from chemo radiation therapy. They have osteoradial necrosis, they have chronic dysphagia, uh, they have chronic dry mouth, uh, and they have chronic aspiration pneumonia. So the current theme in oropharynx cancer is treatment de-intensification, either with smaller doses of chemotherapy and radiation, immunotherapy, something called transoral robotic surgery, which is shown here, which is a more minimally invasive way to access smaller tumors of the oropharynx. So that's kind of what the treatment paradigm is doing. Um, but the truth is, this, this, is a, this is a change epidemic. So in this study, they projected that in 2020, um, that oropharynx cancer would surpass surgical cancer in terms of an HPV-associated cancer. Uh, and then the CDC came out and said in, uh, in 2016 that um, that had already actually occurred based on their, their data. So this is increasing about 2% per year um, and is now the most common, commonly diagnosed cancer uh, in men. So this is, this, is a big, this is a big problem. So this is what people think is gonna happen to oropharynx cancer over the next 20 and 30 years. Uh, ultimately, they think it's going to skyrocket. And of course, you may ask, well, you know, the HPV vaccine has been around since 2006. Why, I mean, this sh should be coming down. But the, ultimately, what we're finding is that the vaccination rate in the U.S. is low. There's a long latency from infection until carcinogenesis. And there's not a screening strategy for orphan cancer, which is a big problem. You know, for cervix, you have pap smears. So we're able to, you're able to screen people for cytologic abnormalities. Um, and ultimately prevent a lot of morbidity and mortality from cancer with, with screening, but we don't have any way to do that in the oropharynx, mainly because these tumors occur in epithelial crypts that aren't really on the surface and can't be, can't be accessed as easily for cytology. Uh, so this is gonna, people think this is really gonna grow over the next 20, 30 years. Um, and this one study projected that by 2045, this is gonna be the mo third most common cancer in men, which is, which is really surprising. I think most people don't think of or oropharynx cancer as being this common a malignancy. And, and this, this is just a graph showing oropharynx cancer surpassing <coughs> cervical cancer. So one question people had was, well, okay, we're, we're finding all these HPV positive tumors now. Maybe, maybe we just didn't know about HPV 20, 30 years ago. Maybe, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, maybe all the oropharynx cancers were so HPV positive. It's not that there's this new wave, it's just we're, we're diagnosing it now. Um, but that's actually been disproved. So they went back into a major clinical trial for oropharynx cancer, and they basically took the paraffin blocks, they punched them, they did DNA sequencing on them, and they found that, you know, in the 80s, the tumors weren't HPV positive. And, you know, over the last 20 years, they have been. So this is, this is, a, this is a big epidemiological problem. Could have mentioned this earlier, but fortunately, HPV-associated oropharynx cancer compared to non-HPV or smoking or alcohol-associated oropharynx cancer actually has a much better prognosis. So about a 25% better overall survival, three-year overall survival based on this large clinical trial relative to HPV negative. So the truth is that a lot of these patients are, are very, very curable with chemo radiation or min minimally invasive surgery. So that's, um, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, the prognosis is so much better that basically we found out that our staging system uh, is essentially, essentially non-informative for these patients because their survival is so much better that uh, we, the AJCC had to go and develop a new staging system to essentially downstage these people uh, because they were doing so much better. So what about HPV in general? So we know this is a, this is a DNA virus, double-stranded. Uh, there's so many subtypes, only about 15 of which have actually been proven to be uh, oncogenic. And really, the, the main thing you need to know about it, this is a very epitheliotropic um, organism that really tends to infect uh, superficial epithelium. So how is this transmitted? It's transmitted primarily through mucosal contact. contact. Um, about 90% of the infections are asymptomatic. I think everyone probably knows that. Um, most people clear the virus. I mean, that's the, you know, 95% of people, their body is able to immunologically clear this virus after a couple months. But in 5% of people, uh, the, the infection will persist in a latent, uh, in a latent phase. Um, so I think we uh, kind of cover this. I mean, one of the big things about oropharynx cancer that's probably leading to the problem is the fact that people, even after they're infected, they actually don't generate an immune response. 
Um, so that a, a, even after an infection, your serologic immune response uh, ultimately develops only about 60% of the time. So this, this graph just kind of shows the progression from infection to carcinogenesis. And uh, you know, this, this process occurs over about 10 to 30 years. We think, we think that smokers are more likely to undergo a transformation of you know, a cytologic abnormality or a dysplasia to a cancer, uh, and certainly immunosuppression. HIV associated, uh, infected patients have a much higher incidence of oropharynx cancer. Um, so this is very interesting. When women get infected with HPV, they tend to actually generate a protective immune response, okay, in about 80% of the time. And men often fail. This has been projected to be about 15 to 20%. And no one really understands why this is. Um, intuitively, it makes sense that the fact that we're seeing so much more oropharynx cancer in males, this may be the reason, just because men are not generating antibodies uh, to uh, prevent these cancers. So how does HPV um, actually cause cancer? Um, so HPV subtype 16 is the most common, causes about 90% of HPV-associated uh, carcinogenesis. So traditionally, we think of these oncoproteins E6 and E7 as being the main drivers of carcinogenesis because they inhibit P53 and retinoblastoma, two tumor suppressor proteins. Um, the truth is, truth is, it's a lot more complicated than that. And basically, what we're finding is that these these HPV viruses integrate into the genome um, and basically cause genomic chaos. And that's that's what ultimately leads to some of the behavior a lot of a lot of these tumors. So in about 70. 70% of the time, these, you can actually find uh, viral DNA in these, uh, integrated into these tumors. So, and it's not just oropharynx cancer. I think we probably all know a lot of this, but you know, HPV accounts for about 5% of cancer-related deaths in the world, um, and there's a variety of other cancers that are driven by HPV. And there's a variety of other processes that aren't, aren't cancers that are also driven by HPV. So on the right here, this is one of a very, this is a very common diagnosis that we see in otolaryngology. Uh, and we see it in kids because the virus is transmitted in a vertical fashion from uh, mother to child. And this is recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, which is a benign process. It's chronic, it's recurrent, it's a real problem. Uh, patients need tracheostomies, they need frequent debridements. Um, and it's, a, it's another example of a really bad disease driven by uh, HPV. So, how do we how do we really slow this down? Um, and intuitively, there's kind of there's kind of two ways, right? You avoid getting infected. That's pretty pretty obvious, right? Or you can or you can vaccinate. So, um, ideally, we do both of those things. Um, but so, how do you avoid it? So, what is this actually being caused by? And the truth is, most of it is most of it is oral sex. That's obvious in the literature. It's a very clearly established risk factor for oropharynx cancer associated with the number of partners. And what a lot of people don't know is oral HPV can also be transmitted by kissing too, which is, you know, most people aren't aware of that. But this, is, this has been very well documented in several large cohort studies. And, um, you know, where do you think they study these things? They study them on college campuses. So a lot of this data on oral HPV was, these are, they're just walking around sampling college kids. Um, this, this study uh, on the bottom here is out of Ohio State. Um, but the, or, the overall prevalence of any oral HPV infection is about 7%. High-risk HPV, maybe about 1.4%. Um, it's more common in men. Um, and um, you know, when you look at the associated data for the cervix, it's about, uh, about 11%. So you know, why is the incidence increasing? Well, you know, there's actually some good data suggests that people's behaviors are changing. You know, people are. Um, having sex at a much earlier age, uh, they're having more partners, and this has been documented in a variety of studies, that overall the incidence of other sexually transmitted diseases has increased um, over the last you know, 20, 30 years. And then you know, a lot of parents say, well, you know, my, my kid doesn't need an HPV vaccine right now, you know, we'll get it later when they're actually grown up. But you know, what does the data actually show about when kids actually um, have sex for the first time, and this is in the Journal of Pediatrics, right? And this is a survey that's a case study where the kids were, um, you know, ensured confidentiality, and they were asked by their pediatrician about their behavior. I mean, these numbers are pretty astounding, right? So, to really have any impact, you need to be doing this stuff around 10 or 11, right? So, that's pretty interesting. Um, I put this up here because this stuff is super popular right now. I thought this was kind of an interesting paper. I kind of ran into uh, 
And uh, these people actually studied people that were on these dating sites. And they let them do you know, cervical swabs on them. And the, the risk of a high risk HPV among this population was 25%. So maybe, uh, maybe think before you uh, get on Tinder or uh, another dating site. So um, this is something that is, you know, if you're a parent, you'll also kind of wonder. So, you know, tonsillectomies used to be really common. Everyone used to have their tonsils out, right? We don't do that anymore. So the incidence of tonsillectomy over the last 20, 30 years has gone down. And why has it gone down? I mean, we essentially figured out that not everyone has to have their tonsils out. Unless you have bad infections or you have sleep apnea, you don't have to take your tonsils out. So we've, we're doing a lot fewer tonsillectomies um, than we previously did. It's still probably the most common procedure done in otolaryngology, but it's dropped a lot. So some people have thought, well, hey, maybe the reason why we're seeing this huge increase in orifying cancer is because we're not taking kids' tonsils out. So should you have your kids' tonsils taken out just to prevent a orifying cancer? This is, this is very new data and very controversial, uh, but the truth is there may be some value to that statement. Uh, so this was a study out of Denmark where they looked at people that have had tonsillectomy in the past that looked at their incidence of oropharynx cancer, and it was a lot less compared to a non-tonsillectomized cohort. So, I mean, it's kind of intuitive. Their incidence of a tonsillar, I mean, most HPV-associated cancers are tonsillar. Uh, if you take the kids' tonsils out, they're less likely to have a tonsillar cancer um, just because they don't have a subsite to be infected. So in this study, it reduced the risk of diagnosis of a tonsillar cancer by 60%. Now this is very, this is very, very new stuff. This is very far from being incorporated into guidelines uh, for tonsillectomy. And if you go to an ENT provider with your kid and you say, hey, listen, I want you to take your tonsils out to prevent uh, oropharynx cancer, they're going to say, you're crazy. That's not like something we do yet. But th this may be on the horizon because the, the data are, are pretty interesting and convincing. Uh, so, I mean, fundamentally, why don't, why don't parents vaccinate their kids? Um, so, I mean, one of the big things is lack of knowledge, right? They don't, they don't understand, um, or they think, you know, a lot of people just don't understand that it's a problem in men, right? They assume their, maybe their daughter has to be vaccinated, but, but maybe not their son. Um, safety concerns, obviously, there's a lot of people that have safety concerns about, you know, long-term adverse effects of vaccines. Uh, they don't think their kids are sexually active, you know, that, that article from the Journal of Pediatrics would suggest otherwise. There's pretty good data that you're not going to necessarily be able to change your kids' behaviors. Um, some parents are actually concerned that they're that getting the kid the vaccine will actually encourage high-risk sexual behaviors, which is like a very interesting thought. Um, but there's no evidence to suggest that that's actually the case. And there's actually been a couple studies that disprove that because it's actually a common reason that people. Uh, don't want to vaccinate their kids. Uh, and, and the last reason is just that the physician is not aware. So we should be able to change the last one pretty easily. So what's really out there? So this vaccine came out in 2006. Uh, right now, the nine-valent Gardasil is the, the only um, uh, vaccine that's currently available in the United States. Um, not surprisingly, it's, it's also the most expensive. But um, it's the only one commercially available in the United States. You know. It includes both high risk and low risk HPV subtypes. You know, we said about 90%, 90% of uh, HPV associated cancer is HPV 16. So if you get the bivalent vaccine, you're, you're pretty good. Um, but it's just not available here. But you know, in third world countries, when they're providing this vaccination, a lot of, a lot of them are just doing so with the bivalent vaccine just because it's, it's cheaper at this point. One of the interesting things is, it's actually, if you actually look at the vaccine, there's no mention of oropharynx cancer. Uh, even though it's the most common HV-associated cancer today, uh, there's no mention of oropharynx cancer, and that's mainly because the, the clinical trials that got these things FDA, FDA approved were all on very carefully controlled trials in cervical cancer, looking at dysplasia as an endpoint, and you just can't you can't do that with oropharynx cancer, so it's actually not included in the uh, indication. Um, so just you know, 2006, it was recommended for. Uh, Girls between 11 and 12 in 2011, you know, started realizing this was this is going to be beneficial for for men as well. Um, and then, in terms of vaccine safety, you know, there's this is one of the most well-studied vaccines ever, just because of the time in which it was developed. So over two 270 million doses have been given uh, globally. 
Um, and there's really no evidence of any systemic adverse effects. So there are case reports, very rare, see listed here, autoimmune MS, Guillain-Barre, um, you know, these are all case reports and there have been very well controlled studies that have really failed to prove any association of uh, this vaccine with any of those. So the most common thing is just local site reactions from the vaccine and about 10% of people, they, they have some soreness or a, you know, a little erythema around the injection site. This all is very, very mild. And the, the WHO has repeatedly uh, made announcements on the safety of this vaccine. So, um, you know, the second question is, is it actually effective? Um, and there's very good data that says that it is and it prevents both pre-malignant and malignant lesions. Um, you know, this is the Patricia trial, which was one of, uh, one of many uh, trials that looked at this in cervical cancer, which basically showed that um, vaccination reduced the risk of, you know, high risk uh, dysplasia in the cervix. Um, you know, we know that when you're vaccinated, you generally have immunity for over uh, 10 years. Um, and, you know, initially people got three doses. What we're finding now is that two doses for most people is, uh, is adequate. So it seems to work in the cervix. Does it actually work? Um, does it actually work in the oropharynx? And does it actually prevent oropharynx cancer? So there's no data right now that it actually prevents oropharyngeal cancer. Um, and those studies are ongoing. But we do know that it does do a good job preventing oral HPV infection. I mean, this is a very uh, recent study uh, where they went around and, uh, in a kind of mobile health unit and did HPV uh, oral, um, basically, washes. And they looked at prevalence and uh, you know, basically screened people to see if, had they been vaccinated or not. Uh, and actually uncovered a lot of interesting things. So ultimately, what was the overall vaccine coverage? When they just went out in the community and they asked people, have you gotten an HPV vaccine? And they actually tested them. So 7% of men were vaccinated, pretty, pretty horrible. Um, you know, 30% of women, a little bit better. Um, and what was, what was actually the risk of a high-risk HPV infection? Um, it was about 1.6, and that's an HPV 16 or 18 infection. So it's small, but it's not, it's not insignificant. But the, what they found is that when people had actually gotten a, um, an HPV vaccine in the past, you know, they, they saw almost a 90% reduction in, in an actual and active HPV infection. So they actually put together some nice population-based extrapolation in terms of incorporating what the vaccination rate is, what the incidence of oral HPV infection was, and basically what they found is that our current status right now, we're, we're preventing about 17% of oral HPV infections based on the incidence and based on our current vaccination rate. So that's pretty terrible, right? Because, I mean, most of these things are, are clearly preventable with early vaccination, and as a, as a, from a public health standpoint, we're not, we're not doing great. Um, so this is just the, C the uh, CDC guidelines. Um, you know, when you're over 15 or 16, you require three doses, at least that's what the evidence says. Uh, if you're younger, two doses. They say years 11 to 12 are kind of the ideal time to vaccinate just because a few studies have shown that the serologic response to vaccination is better, um, you know, in this, in this age group. If you go on the CDC website, there's a list of you know, pretty short list of recommendations and contraindications. There's almost no contraindications. Um, you know, certain populations based on age and if you're immunosuppressed and they, there's, a, there's a list of uh, immunosuppressed states that you actually require three doses instead of two, uh, but, it's, but it's pretty straightforward. So what percentage of the U.S. population is, or actually this is, this is adolescence, I believe. Yeah, this was adolescence. What percentage were full dose covered in the United States? So 40%. Um, and when you compare that to, you know, in this graph, another common and, you know, uh, standard uh, immun 